Now I've travelled all the way to America to a place called Portland in the state of Maine and I'm going to meet and interview Peter Hyatt. Peter Hyatt is an expert on statement analysis and he actually gives lectures and teaches people how to analyse witness statements and we're going to be discussing the Madeleine McCann case. Today I am joined by Peter Hyatt uh, whose expertise is in statement analysis. Um, Peter, can you just tell us uh, how did you become interested in statement analysis? Um, quite a number of years ago, I was a self-described naive, very easy to, to see person. So I began reading um, books on statement analysis just as a hobby. Mm -hmm. But eventually, um, this led into an employment where uh, I was given initial 200 hours of training um, back in late 2001, I believe, um, in legally sound interviewing. And um, from there, I went into more formal training, worked on cases as a, a state investigator for allegations of child abuse and later on allegations of adult abuse. But then I went to teaching statement analysis. And after teaching it, it was very natural that um, those who attended would ask for assistance. And sometimes that assistance translated into, would you do the investigation for us, especially in private companies? From there, I became more and more involved with law enforcement, in training law enforcement, assisting law enforcement. Um, and so currently I work full time as an analyst and an instructor, um, teaching law enforcement, teaching uh, journalists, lawyers, uh, therapists, um, all different professionals who study the techniques used to discern deception, but also content analysis. So it goes well beyond just saying if someone is lying or not, what are they lying about? Why are they lying? Mm -hmm. Which leads to the ultimate is when someone sends an anonymous threatening letter, statement analysis is often able to identify who wrote this letter and what the person that wrote the letter is like. Right. This allows them to know is this threat real? The training involves um, testing, quizzes, practice, more tests, more quiz, more practice. Um, eventually, we offer certification. And this is also part of the University of Maine's continuing education units, uh, we call it CEUs, for professional licenses. Mm -hmm. So um, people are, are involved in formal training are able to reach a level of certification. The certification is only worth what the work shows it to be. And in many detecting deception schools, they run around 70% success. For us, that would be an abysmal result. These investigators are running at or near 100% success rate. Right. And you can test that by, you make an assertion during the investigation stage based on their statements and then if someone is then convicted on other evidence you know that you were co you know that you were correct so that gives yes. you a way of measuring uh, th the performance yeah that's one way of measuring um, this is actually rather exciting is a an easier way to measure the success is the confession yeah the confession or admission and, and we have that more than convictions because when a person is deceptive and during the interview process where they are confronted using their own words. It is legally sound, it is non-interpretive, but where they're confronted with their own words, they often will either confess or admit what they have done. Now the difference between a confession and admission is um, legally we need uh, one or the other, but um, an admission is to acknowledge what one has done. A confession would say, what I've done is this, plus it's morally wrong. We don't need a confession, we do need an admission. Mm -hmm. Then we have something, um, it's called the A to Z. This is very exciting. An A to Z is where an investigator, say in law enforcement, receives a report of an allegation. Someone has stolen. And before any of the interviews or any of the investigation begins, the person who is accused of stealing is told to write out what happened. They are to sit down comfortably, choose their own words. They're given bottled water in a comfortable setting, there is no threats, there is no uh, coercion. Please tell us in your own words what happened. 
And the person says, well, where do I begin? Wherever you feel comfortable beginning. So we don't introduce any language to them or any words. Mm. The person writes out what happened. If we are, then take that statement and properly analyze it in a scientific method, meaning we expect the same results, putting in the same data repeatedly, the investigator can now know this person did it, when he did it, how he did it, why he did it. So now a lengthy investigation has been shortened greatly. And A to Z is this, is the person is then interviewed based on their own words from that analysis. It's called analytical interviewing. No new language is introduced. The subject is not uh, threatened at all. The subject is not um, interrupted. He is allowed to speak freely about what happened. When he reaches a point where he is caught by his own words, he often will admit what he did. Mm. When he admits what he has done, the investigator then takes the analysis, hands it to him, and says, review this for me. And there's often this type of unity between the investigator and the now suspect, where the suspect shares, oh, your, an your analysis was correct here. Yeah, you're right. I did hide the gun there. And they're able to go mm -hmm. through it. That investigator is now filled with resolve and confidence that he takes into other investigations. Mm -hmm. So it is fantastic traction for their careers. It's a strength for truth. And it becomes a lesson like no other. The expression, giving someone enough rope to hang themselves, comes to mind. <laughs> that would be a good way of using it. They made their own rope with their own words. We didn't hand it to them in that sense. Mm. So it's, it's legally sound. Right. And obviously the police have the benefit of being able to put someone in that position and, and not force them to be questioned, but request them to do that. But certain cases that have been high profile in the media, we don't always get that. We don't always get the luxury to be able to... Um, put a subject in an interview type situation to write out their version of events. We, we go by snippets that have uh, come out in the media and we are going to come on to a, a case shortly. Um, can, can you recall what the first case you looked at was? The first case that I worked for someone else, I, I've, I've had success on my own, but the first case that I actually worked for someone else came after an instruction where there had been a theft and local police had investigated the theft, but what they determined was that the company had too many employees that could have done it. Mm -hmm. And therefore, they just closed it as unsolved. And the company had sent employees for training. And they asked if I could review their work. And then they eventually asked, could you take over for us? So I had all the employees write out what they did during their shift. I came back and said, here's the one that stole it. Here's when he stole it. Here's how he stole it. They asked if I would conduct the interview. I did, and he confessed. Right, very good. And um, have you got a, a rough figure as to how many cases you've looked at? Um, hundreds. hundreds. It, it would be hard to, to tell right. because it's um, many, most cases, I should say, at this point in my life, most cases I'm just assisting investigators. Mm -hmm. They're the ones doing the work. They're the ones that, um, and many of them are so good that they'll send me their analysis. That's, that's a, an important thing. A good analyst never stands on his or her own footing. We always ask someone to check our work, always a second set of eyes, at least. Mm -hmm. And so we have many now in training that um, other law enforcement is asking them for help now because they're so good at it. Right. They're driven for justice. And um, is your work ever used in court uh, or by other professionals? Well, it, it's used in court routinely. Statement analysis, like the polygraph, is not admissible as evidence. What happens is, is during even a cross-examination, the trained investigator is using statement analysis as he goes into testimony. So for instance, an example of this is a man who was accused of murder, uh, took the stand in his own defense. And this is an example of how a prosecutor used the statement analysis to a successful conclusion. The man had been accused of killing a 13-year-old little girl out in the woods. He had claimed that he was alone in the woods. So, and when he took the stand in his own defense, the prosecutor asked, well, tell us what happened and what happened next. Those are the two most powerful questions that we have. What happened? What happened next? Mm -hmm. It allows them to choose whatever they want to choose. And, and this is an important point. The average person has an, a vocabulary of about 20,000 words. When you ask someone what happened, 
they must go into that vocabulary, decide what words to use out of the 20,000, where to order them, what verb tenses to use, what pronouns to use, where to place each word next to each other to communicate in less than a microsecond of time. That is a process that when disrupted by deception, we catch. This man said he was alone. I was sitting down admiring the deciduous trees when we were losing daylight, so I got up and the prosecutor said, excuse me, you said we were losing daylight? The pronoun we is instinctive and intuitive. It meant he was not alone. The defense called for a recess. The next day they came back and attempted to explain away why the word we should mean I. The jury didn't buy it. He was convicted. Mm -hmm. Okay. And um, do you purely look at written statements or do you listen to audio or do you watch a video? Um, D, all of the above. All of the above. Yeah. The training begins with only written statements, and that's really the most effective means of doing this. But what happens is, very naturally, it's called statement analysis, moves to a form of discourse analysis when someone becomes better and better over time. Their listening skills improve, and they're able to analyze as they're speaking. Hmm. Okay. And I've got a list here of some areas that perhaps can indicate deception. Do you want to mention some of it, uh, Peter, before, sure. we, before we analyze um, the interview that we're going to look at? Sure. Um, so hesit hesitation. Well, we look at a disruption. Now, some people naturally will hesitate as they speak. So we look for a pattern. If someone is suddenly hesitating, we want to know why. So we call this a sensitivity indicator, uh, meaning, for example, if I ask you a question and you answer the question with a question, you're buying yourself some time. I know this is an important question. It doesn't necessarily mean that you're being deceptive, but you've sure caught my attention. Right, okay. And searching for the right words? Well, thoughtful people can do that, but when they are under a certain context, like uh, in a missing child case, we want to know how, what is the relationship between the missing child and the subject speaking. If it is a very close relationship, we generally don't see someone pausing or searching just for the right words. They don't care. Mm. All they care about is the missing child. Mm -hmm. And diverting, avoiding questions? A common form of deception. All right. Um, let me, what about um, unnecessary uh, um, expansion on, on, on certain subjects, like w using woolly jargon and that kind of thing? Is that, can that be a form of deception? Yes. As a matter of fact, it's one of the most important things we look at. When someone uses an unnecessary word, unnecessary phrase, unnecessary detail, we deem it as doubly important. Right. Um, I'll give you a good example of that. When I go to the store, in order for me to go to a store, I have to leave where I'm at. So someone will say, I went to the store. The pronoun I went past tense and the store is where they went. It is very likely, statistically, to be reliable. But if someone says, I left my house and went to the store, it's unnecessary to tell us that they left the house because you can't get to the store unless you leave. Mm. So we know something happened at the house that you're not telling me. 70% likelihood that it has to do with time or rushing or couldn't find my keys, something like that. But 30% of the time, it's critically withheld information. Right. And what about uh, distancing language, where you try and refer to a group rather than yourself? Yeah, there's a, a couple of different forms of distancing language, and we look at distancing language and flag it as such. Um, I went Christmas shopping with Heather. I and Heather couldn't be any further apart in the sentence than I just made it. What caused the distancing? Did we have an argument? Did I not want to go shopping? I could have said, Heather and I went Christmas shopping, mm -hmm. but I didn't. So I went Christmas shopping with Heather, puts me and Heather far apart. Sometimes the distance is nothing more than geographical. Sometimes it is strongly psychological. In cases where um, we expect very closeness, like if, if an assault case, a missing person case. An assault case is very personal. The language should reflect that. 
when someone has something happen to them where their body space was invaded and they were harmed, there's a hormonal response that's always going to show itself in the language. Mm -hmm. So when someone says that they were assaulted and there's distancing language, we look for deception. Okay. And what about the use of the word would? I would have done instead of I did do. Sure. It's one of the things that deceptive people use. And here's why. Um, I said before that the average person has 20,000 words in their vocabulary. A more intelligent person might have 25, even 30,000 words. And when you ask them what happened, they must go into their memory. And when experiential memory speaks, it is very smooth and it goes in chronological order. A lie will disrupt that. And that causes internal stress. So people say, well, you know, sociopaths don't feel stressed when they're, when they're lying. That's not true. They feel very stressed when they're lying because they don't want to be caught. So to disrupt that process is very stressful. And those that are really good at lying will use a substitute of words. So one of the things they'll do, instead of saying, I did not use performance enhancing drugs, they say, I never used performance enhancing drugs. I would never. Uh, and what they're doing is they're actually distancing themselves from an actual denial. We saw this many years ago in Lance Armstrong, where he uh, repeatedly used the word would never or never. Uh, in all the years that I watched his interviews, all the transcripts that I've seen, not once did he say, I didn't use performance enhancing drugs. Hmm. He avoided it. <laughs> and what about qualifying words which change or weaken a statement? Tell us about that. Sure. Um, it can be used appropriately. It can be used inappropriately. If I said to you, I locked my keys in the car, you can be confident that I know where my keys are. They're locked in the car. If I said to you, I think I locked my keys in the car, that's called a weak assertion because I'm not certain if they're there. I did not shoot that man is very different from saying, I don't think I shot the man. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And, um, what about using the past tense um, about a recently missing person? This is critical. Um, in all missing person cases, we look at the use of past tense. And Richard, when it comes to a missing child and a close relative, meaning the biological father or the mother, there is a, such a natural denial, even stronger in women than men, that we have cases where a child has gone missing the child has been found deceased and the mother refuses to reference her child in the past tense. She just cannot accept it. Mm -hmm. So if a mother in particular or a father, but especially a mother with the increased intensity of the bond references her child in the past tense, we want to know something. We want to know why, excuse me, why she thinks or believes the child is deceased. Because at times, even if the police tell them, we believe your child is dead, a mother will not accept that. Mm -hmm. So when a mother of a missing child speaks of the child in the past tense early on before the processing has taken place, she's giving us a strong indication that she may know more than she's saying. All right. And um, what about refusing a polygraph test? Can, can you read anything into that or not? Yes. Um, John Walsh has become famous, unfortunately, for the tragedy that happened in his life here in America. And he advises people very publicly. And what I mean by very publicly is not just through his own website, but through every television appearance he does regarding missing children, is he says to the parents, take a polygraph immediately so the police can do their work and find your child. When someone refuses to take a polygraph, they have a reason to refuse it. And that's a great concern. Right. Okay. And tell us about the ratio of how much time people spend when they're telling a story at the, the beginning and the middle of it and, and end and what that might reveal. Sure. We actually measure the content of someone's account. And a truthful account will generally be broken down into um, three parts. If your child went missing, and I were to ask you questions about it, the most important thing to you is your child missing. That's what you're going to talk about. And so the bulk of your words are going to be focused on your child and what happened. You might introduce it saying, I went to dinner and that's a short introduction. And then you talk about your child and then afterwards you called 911 or you called police or you called for assistance. 
but the bulk of your account is going to be found right in the middle. What happened to your child is the most important thing to you. Deceptive people who have guilty knowledge of what happened to their child don't want to talk about it because it causes internal stress. So they talk a great deal of time in what happened beforehand. That's where they focus their details. Whereas any parent without guilty knowledge, any innocent parent is going to focus upon the child. Now, when I say innocent, I mean a de facto innocence, not a judicial innocence. People are, are innocent until proven or guilty in a court of law in the United States. What I mean by innocent is the de facto or in fact innocence. They have no guilty knowledge of what happened to their missing child. Mm -hmm. That type of innocence. So right. It's important yeah. to... Yes, yeah, I understand uh, that. Now, uh, you run a blog, Peter, where a lot of this uh, statement analysis subject is discussed. Um, can you put everything on there, all of your professional cases, or are you limited as to what you can write on the blog? Yeah, the, the blog is, is only cases that I'm not professionally involved in. So um, the most fascinating cases never reach the blog. The blog is also a tool of advertising for my business. The blog catches the attention of investigators and uh, who say, oh, you know, I'd like to study that more in depth. Most of them have had some training in their academies. Um, some were privileged to go on to the FBI's National Academy where they learned uh, deception detection. Um, but what I produce on the blog is uh, short summaries, not in-depth analysis. It would be take far too long to explain some of the things there. Mm -hmm. On the case of um, missing Madeline McCann, I didn't cover it a, a great deal. Uh, it fascinated me, but I didn't cover a great deal because it seemed that it was saturated with coverage. Mm -hmm. And um, when something becomes that heavily covered, I generally move on to something else. And so I put a general analysis on the blog about it, but really in the interview, there's much more there than much more right. in the content of the analysis mm -hmm. than is on the blog. So this was an interview that the McCanns did in 2011, and I think it was on Australian television. And you, you did a, an analysis of, of that interview, of what they said in that interview, of their statements. So you transcribe the interview first, and then you've, you've put your analysis on the blog. So w why did you choose that particular one? Was there any reason, or was it just the, the first one you came across? What, was there any reason why you chose that one? Because they've done a lot of interviews. Yeah, this was one that someone sent the transcripts to me. Right. Um, transcription services is expensive and it's time consuming. I can't do that. I, I can't go um, that. So there are people that are associated with the blog who will send um, trusted transcribed interviews to me. And I have to make a decision at any given time. What do I have enough time to go into? Mm -hmm. I also have to weigh in is that if I get involved with this and law enforcement sees it and contacts me, I've got to delete it and try to assist them. Sorry, what, you have to delete that. Why would you have to delete it? It, it? You mean on that case, if they get in touch with you? Uh, on a, yeah, on any, on any given case, if, if law enforcement requests that it not be there, that it could hinder the investigation, I take it down. Oh, I see. So let's say that people who were investigating the Madeline case weren't happy with that and ask you to take it down, right? I see. Yeah. Or if, if a, and this has happened before too, is where um, a police department will say, I saw your analysis, it's really good. Could you help me on this case? I delete it because I can't mm. comment on something that's going to be adjudicated. Right. Um, right. I don't ever want to interfere with justice. Justice comes before anything else. Right. And before we um, do some analysis on on this interview, because you, you, you've you've reappraised it, is that right to say that this 2011 interview, you've done more detailed analysis on it? Is that yes? It, it my conclusion hasn't changed. My general conclusion hasn't changed. But what I've done is more intense analysis, and there's there's several reasons for that. One of the reasons is. Uh, your interest. Your interest is a professional interest here that is deeper than just an average person reading an article. You'd like to know the truth and in detail. Mm -hmm. And so I can give you some of the details. But there's also something else, and this really applies to so much else in life as well, is when we do analysis of a case and we review the analysis later on, we generally will pick up a little bit here, a little bit there that we may have missed or didn't focus upon. 
when we reanalyze something from what we call disparate eyes, from, from a mind that has moved on to other things, it is called the 40% rule. The same content may yield 40% more information. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's, it's quite practical in the sense that your mind goes on a scent. You pick up a scent and you follow it. And once you follow it to completion, you've got a good portrait. When you look at it again, maybe a month later, you don't have that same scent. Mm -hmm. And you say, oh, you know, I need to focus a little more on something else here now. And that yields more and more content. Then you can take it and hand it to another trained anal analyst who now brings in more information. And so although it doesn't change the conclusion, it enhances the analysis itself. Mm -hmm. We're literally entering into the perception of reality from the speaker. Before you tell us your analysis on this interview, um, just want to mention the legal aspects of this. This is um, opinion. Yeah, there's no, there's no statement of uh, innocence or guilt. Is that just tell us w what an analysis in, is in those terms? Yeah, this is we call presuppositional thinking. We go into a statement presupposing an opinion. Now, when someone speaks publicly. There is an expectation that is presupposed. You're either going to believe me or you're not. And the public, we have a right to say, I believe what they're telling me. I don't believe what they're telling me. It is just my opinion. If I say I believe someone or I don't believe someone, as a statement analyst, it's my opinion. And here's why I have this opinion. So I'm able to explain why. Now, this is not, it sounds like a moral exercise. It's not. When someone speaks, we presuppose that everything they're telling us is the truth. We actually go into the analysis believing everything they said, unless they talk us out of it. Mm -hmm. If they talk, about, talk us out of it, not only are we able to pick up that they are deceiving us, but the words that they chose in deceiving us can often reveal what happened. Mm -hmm. And that's what I believe is the case but, we're going to look at. But because the analysis is your opinion, you've not had any legal issues from from subjects that you've done analysis on in the past, just to ask that question. Well, I've had some complaints. Um, Representative Anthony Weiner from New York was upset several years ago about my analysis. Um, he had been um, sexting, sending sexual pictures to people from his phone, and he claimed that it wasn't him doing it. Oh, right. And so uh, I had received a complaint from them, and I said, number one, it's my opinion. Number two, I'll take it down when he tells the truth. Right. And since then, it's... And it's you know, okay. Yeah. We're, and you're confident, because you, you obviously understand why I'm asking that question, yeah. don't you? Yeah. And you, but you're confident that, that because it's opinion, it's absolutely fine to say and, and, and there's no ramifications. Yeah. Unless someone has been convicted in a court of law, they are judicially innocent. And we have an opinion whether we believe that's accurate or not. Mm -hmm. um, however, because of what I do for a living, my opinion has consequences. So if I am able to go through an entire interview uh, like the McCanns gave and make a conclusion, it's going to impact my ability to provide for my family. So uh, anyone can have an opinion that's perfectly appropriate. It's legal to have an opinion. Um, if I have an opinion, I can say anywhere between 10% to 100% certainty of my opinion there's something on the line there for me. If I am wrong, law enforcement is not likely to hire me to work for them. Right. But first, for four years, Kate and Jerry McCann have lived a never-ending ordeal and they still don't know when or if it'll ever end. It began on a family holiday in Portugal when Madeline, their four-year-old daughter, simply vanished. She hasn't been seen since. Tonight, the mystery deepens. You're about to see home video never shown before and learn the vital clue Madeline left behind. Here's Ronnie Sadler. Okay, spin around, darling. Okay. Right round. Oh, yes, I can see your wings. It's a big smile. <laughs> oh, yes. One more big smile. That's pretty. She was an incredibly beautiful baby, actually. You sound like the most biased parents on uh. the planet now, but she, she was just really compact and just a really kind of nice, round, perfect head. And 
you know, and then then she then. opened her mouth and <laughs> the whole world knew she was uh, with us. This would not be considered a, a blatant past tense use of the verb was. Uh, here she says, she was incredibly beautiful baby, actually. One could argue that she, at age three, she's no longer a baby and that they are referring to a period of when she was born. And that would be an appropriate use of the past tense. So I don't assign to this a red flag because of the context. It does concern me at this point, it's just a little bit of alarm now, that in an interview of a missing child, they're talking about her in the past tense. I expect some form of follow-up that will be in the present tense. A single slip into past tense is an indicator of belief or knowledge that the child is deceased. And that's what's concerning about that. But there are also some other things that, that, that are there that aren't any major blaring red, red flags. But as they build point after point, they become concerning. One of the things is this. Parents of missing children who show guilty knowledge of what happened to the child will often find a subtle way of insulting the child, insulting the victim, blaming the victim, disparaging the victim. When someone is missing, like or when a child is deceased, we call it the angelic view. The child is elevated beyond any normal child. They just, everything is wonderful. And we hear the subtle disparagement in guilty parents. Uh, Casey Anthony actually called her little daughter a name, a derogatory name. Um, in shaken baby syndrome cases, the baby wouldn't stop crying as if it was the baby's fault. The baby wouldn't take her formula as if the baby was at fault. And what that is in guilty statements, within human nature, there is some drive to justify what happened, to clear oneself. So I don't like the um, several things about this. I don't like a past tense reference without following up present tense. It continued there. And we have a praising of the baby that I do like. And then when she opened her mouth, the whole world knew she was with us. It's a subtle way of saying that she was really loud. I'm not sure that sounds like praise. I have six children. Um, I have two grandchildren. And I listen to the words of parents regularly. And given the setting of an interview where her, the child is missing, it's not something I expected to hear. Mm -hmm. Now, it's not a point I'm going to hang my hat on, but I've been called to the attention now that maybe Madeline was a little bit loud for them. It's a really strange place to be giving even a small complaint. It's a McCann level volume. There's no <laughs> doubt about that. Yay! Well done. Okay, let's sing another one. I always wanted to be a mother. Um, I don't know if maybe that stemmed from being an only child and sort of, you know, wanting that feeling of family. Madeline was the daughter Kate and Jerry McCann always wanted. For years, Kate struggled to fall pregnant so when Madeline came along, they felt blessed. They loved to photograph her, and she loved being photographed. This is the last picture of Madeline, taken seven hours before she disappeared. There's a photo of her that afternoon that was taken at 2.29, 2 I think, because we've got it on the digital camera. And she was just sitting by the pool uh, with myself, and we've both got our feet just paddling and she is so happy. I am concerned, again lightly, but it is increasing and here's why. They're speaking in terms of nostalgia. This is what we do when a child is not coming back. They are waxing nostalgic about a child that's missing. And this is going to become 
right now a very minor point is going to become a major red flag for deception. If you are able to put yourself into their shoes, which is what we always do, put yourself in the shoes, what would you be like? What would you be like if your child was missing? And this is what um, is terribly missing from the interview. Statement analysis deals with what one tells us. It also deals with what one doesn't tell us. When parents of missing children have no involvement or no guilty knowledge of what happened to the child, their focus is on what the child is experiencing now. Does she have her favorite blankie? Does she have her teddy bear? Does, is, is someone looking at her warm smile? Are they kissing her? Is she scared at night? They are consumed by these thoughts. These people are speaking as if they have already processed something, which is her death. It's been 1,543 days since Madeleine McCann vanished. To keep Madeline's case alive, this private couple has revealed more of themselves than ever before. Kate and Jerry are both doctors. They married in 1998 and in 2001, after three years of failing to conceive naturally, they began IVF. 18 months later, on the eve of another hospital appointment, Kate did a home pregnancy test. A little line appeared on the test. You know, I'm a doctor and it says on the box, any kind of line is a positive, but I was like, oh, I'm not sure, not sure. But there was that faint kind of... Showed it's me and I'm like, it's definitely. <laughs> it's definitely. Oh, no. no question. Yeah. <laughs> and obviously we had a scan and uh, there was a little beaten heart and that was our little Madeline, you know, so... Who's that present for? That's for Auntie Claire. Are we going to post it today? No. We are. This is a letter. Uh -huh. Who says uh-huh? Uh-huh. Say yes, Daddy. Yes, Daddy. Okay. And then, in May 2003, three became five. When she first saw the twins, she was just ecstatic. Absolutely ecstatic. really at that time. You say the family felt really complete. Mm. Yeah. We did feel incredibly lucky. In late April 2007, the McCanns decided to travel to Portugal for a family holiday. In the pink pants climbing the stairs to the plane is Madeline. It was the McCann's first overseas holiday as a family, and they went with three other couples. Cheer up, Jerry, we're on holiday. <laughs> it's a small resort. It was out at sea at the end of April, beginning of May, and it was incredibly quiet. Um, we felt very relaxed there, very relaxed. A couple of things about that is we like to hear people speak for themselves how they felt, um, not for we. Then we look at anything that's repeated, so we have the word relaxed, repeated. We have the word very repeated. So very relaxed, very relaxed, and not for himself, Jerry, but for both of them speaking. Okay. Um, so if they're speaking together, that's appropriate. They're now speaking, he's now speaking of their emotion together, and that's not always so usual. And they are telling us how very relaxed they are. This is narrative storytelling. This is setting a scenario. We call it the normal factor. If you take a seven-year-old child and you say to the child, once upon a time, on a day that was just like every other day, the child will sit up knowing that what's about to happen was unlike any other day. Mm -hmm. That's called the normal factor. If someone says, I'm a normal man, what they're saying to you is either they themselves or someone else has said, you're not normal. It's unnecessary. Well, here, what we call this as a need to persuade that this was a normal day is telling us he knows it's anything but. Mm -hmm. That's storytelling. That's, that's when um, those in law enforcement will say, I feel like they're storytelling. They're actually narrative building. 
They're bringing your emotions into an account. Instead of saying, my daughter's missing. I don't know what she's experiencing. I don't know who she's looking at. I don't know if they're giving her her medicine. With that urgency, they are, not only did they wax nostalgic, but now they're allowing you to enter into their emotions. And I want you to make sure that you understand my emotions were very relaxed. So at some point you say, wow, you sure seem to need to convince me that it was a normal relaxing day. Why do you have to convince me of that? In the evening, the children were put to bed by half past seven before the adults had dinner together down at the pool. From where they ate, Kate and Jerry could see the back of their apartment and left the door unlocked. If you measure it directly from the back of the apartment, there's a straight line to where we're dining. It's only 50 metres. 50 metres. Uh, that's, that's a direct line 49. now. 49.4 on Google if you want to be really specific. Okay, now one would say in defence of them is that, hey, they've been accused of neglect. And they're defending themselves so much to the point that Kate went online and Googled it and found out exactly the distance that it was away. There's a problem with that, however. She's missing. I expect them to talk about not defense of themselves, but concern for her right now, at this moment of the interview. It's not there. Statement analysis deals with what one says and what one doesn't say. Now we're being given a lot of detail about the distance. Before, I was given a lot of detail about what Madeline was like. I've not heard yet a single detail about what Madeline's experiencing in the hands of strangers. But the proximity was very close. This is um, insightful because, first of all, the word but will refute what just preceded it or minimize what preceded it. But this is insightful. I simply ask a listener to answer this question for me. Who are they most concerned about? Are they most concerned about Madeline or about themselves? How can they not be concerned about Madeline? How could they even care? They should be really accusing themselves of neglect. The fact that they don't accuse themselves of neglect but are justifying themselves tells you something else. Not only do we not have concern for Madeline, we have concern for self. Why would you be concerned for self? Madeline and the twins slept in a room at the front of Villa 5A. Kate and Jerry believed their shuttered bedroom window, overlooking the car park and street, was closed and locked. Every half an hour, the parents would take turns to check on each other's children. We thought that was the best thing. Um, and it seemed to work absolutely fine. And we didn't have any problem right up until the Thursday morning when Madeline said, well, why didn't you come when we cried last night? We thought that's odd. Okay, well, um, when you look at the, the word but I mentioned before, that should call your attention to what preceded it. And what Kate had said was 49.4 on Google, if you, really, if you want to be really specific, and I asked the question, who would want to be really specific in this case? Well, the investigators would be. When a child goes missing, the parents, the innocent parents' brain never shuts off. This is why they don't sleep, not just the anxiety, but they replay everything in their mind due to a hormonal rush. The fight or flight hormone is, is elevated, it's up there. In this hormonal increase, their mind goes to detail, particularly when they try to sleep. They will often call the voicemail of a detective and say, I just thought of this and I just thought of that. Always on alert, high alert. Here we have this type of high alert detail but not about Madeline, about justifying themselves. So with that, with that context, the context now is they are concerned for themselves. When a child goes missing, this is very personal to a mother, and this is very personal to a father. No matter what, when a child falls, a father feels responsible. The father didn't protect the fall, even though he really has no reason to blame himself. We do that. It's just natural. We speak for ourselves. At this point, I am not comfortable with the word we here, we thought, because now he's entering into what she thought. And listen to his words. We thought, not I, but we thought that was the best thing, and then a pause, or a um, and it seemed to work 
not fine, but absolutely fine. Then he says, we didn't have any problems. Now, when we ask people what happened, um, what happened is limited to a finite number of things. And they will choose which is most important to tell us. When someone tells us what didn't happen, what didn't happen is an infinite number of things. So when they tell us what didn't happen, we are on high alert now for very, very possible deception. And here's what we have. Until Madeline said, or when Madeline said, why didn't you come when we cried last night? How old was Madeline? When yeah, three, this? three, nearly four. Yeah. Sure, as a parent, as a grandparent, and someone who taught parenting classes for years, many years ago, children are by nature narcissistic. A child will say, when I cried, not we. The child is not going to show concern at that age for little babies, yeah. unless two things, unless the child is a little bit older, five or six, and the child is parentified, meaning the, the neglect in the home has been so severe that the five or six year old is being the parent to others. Mm -hmm. And you'll see this in child abuse cases where uh, a, a neglectful mother will say, look how she can cook her own meals on a little hands that should never be near a stove or an oven. Um, the neglectful parent is boasting about it. Well here, Madeline did not express concern for others crying other than herself. She's too little to do that. It's when I cried. So at that point, based on that pronoun usage, as a professional analyst, I'm comfortable saying this is not a truthful statement. Do you now think somebody had either tried to get into the room or was in the room and woke them up the night before? It just seems too much of a coincidence that she made that comment and then that happened that night. Yes, what, what is she's now doing is she's floating doubt for people. She's floating doubt. She, it, she's test and she's going to do it more, uh, more intensely coming up in a moment here. But she's allowing for people to enter into an emotion that doesn't exist. And this is very important in statement analysis. When we experience something that is emotionally charged, I once had a, a man point a 9 millimeter gun at my head as he was robbing someone uh, in a drug robbery. After it was over, I called police to make the report. I was fine. A couple hours later, I shook with emotion. Like, what just happened? The reason being, it takes time for us to process emotions. If I were to tell you a truthful account of what happened, it's not riveting. It would sound very boring. If I process all the emotions years later and I tell it a storytelling, I would say this. I once stood in the darkness, and when a man pointed the nine millimeter gun at my head, the hairs on the back of my neck stood up. And I would tell a story to engage you into the emotions. We call that artificial placement of emotions. Editing, storytelling, narrative building. Um, by the way, I'm not sure if the, anyone is, is paying attention at this point. There's a missing child here that I've had no concern expressed for. This is why this interview jumped out at me. All right. Um. She's actually bringing to the point where the three-year-old child is some sort of intuitive expert. Right. Your child is missing. What are you doing? When are you going to talk about that? Looking back now, you think that could have been your one chance to save her? Well, as, as soon as um, I discovered that Madeline had been taken, it just, it just hit me straight away what she'd said that morning, and I just thought, oh my God, someone tried the night before. Okay, in statement analysis, we have a number of sensitivity indicators that are very closely associated with deception. In fact, in this sentence itself, there's enough to conclude deception. First of all, she is infusing emotion into reporting what just should have been said. Second of all, she's going to a conclusion. She didn't say, as soon as I saw that Madeline was missing, she said had been taken. She didn't know that. What parents of missing children do is they report their child missing. They don't know if someone took them. They don't know what happened mm. or if the child ran away. By jumping to the conclusion, she wants to make sure that you know there's a kidnapping. 
She has a need to persuade the audience that it was a kidnapping. The need to persuade itself underlies the weakness. Then the inclusion of the emotions at the perfect point of the statement tells us that's artificially placed there, narrative building. Then we have the infusion of deity. This is often found statistically in deceptive people. They're looking for a greater witness than their own words. When I ask someone, why should I believe you? Because I told the truth. Because I'm telling you the truth. The, the weight of testimony is because it's true. Which says, basically, if you don't believe me, you're an idiot. Get a new job. You shouldn't even be investigating. Because I told the truth. There's, the, the burden is on you because I'm free because I told the truth. No matter how much you dig, you'll never find contrary because it's truth. The entire weight of the argument is based upon truth. If someone says, I didn't steal the money, why should I believe you? Because I'm telling the truth. 99.9% .9 north, they're telling the truth. That's how powerful it is. They're basing their denial upon truth. When someone has a need to bring in a divine witness to what they're saying, and, and, and here in this case of doing that, she's making the assertion that Madeline had been taken, which is already conclusionary, then calling on a divine witness by the inclusion of the word God. Okay? We could indicate here deception by itself and be confident that she's not telling the truth either. All right. Um, oh, excuse me, another point with this, because there's actually a lot more here right. in this small answer. The word just, um, in statement analysis, we look at dependent words. Dependent words are those that don't work without another thought. So if I said, uh, this is my only child, instead of saying this is my child, this is my only child, what are you thinking of? The word only means you're thinking of something else. Did you lose a child? Did you try to have a child, couldn't have another one? You know, what happened there? Something happened. Um, in her case, the word just, it just hit me, and the word just hit me is the timing of the emotion, Okay, the emotion doesn't belong here, but it's part of her storytelling. And I just thought, my God, someone tried the night before. The word just there means she's comparing this thought with something else. Deceptive people do it all the time. They're comparing the thought that they're floating for the audience with the truth. What really happened. Mm -hmm. It's a small point. But when enough small points come together, it's a large point. Mm -hmm. In that, that answer, we have her logical conclusion, her comparisons. Um, we have her giving detail that doesn't add up to what children respond like. And we know that at this particular point in the statement, her concern should not be what a three-year-old thought, but what my three-year-old is going through right now, and that again is missing. On Thursday night, Kate put her daughter to bed for the last time. But my memory of that evening is really vivid. I mean, she was really tired, but she was just cuddled up on my knee and we read a story. And we also had some treats, <laughs> we had some crisps and biscuits. Um, and then after they'd done the usual kind of toilet teeth um, we went through to the bedroom and read another story if you're happy and you know it um, yeah. when she moves into experiential memory of what happened she can choose anything she'd like to tell us the words she chooses are going to be important so my memory of that evening first of all we have the word that which distanced herself from that night and which could be appropriate because it's chronologically it's, it's distant she said it's really vivid it's really vivid and that's interesting because that type of clarification comes when there's a hormonal increase the fight-or-flight hormone that that cortisone and others that rise in the body to the brain brings great clarity of thought but if this was a normal, quiet, happy evening, what would cause such vividness in her memory? 
So she's, what she's doing is she's, tell, she's narrowed a building, but she's telling us that this night was anything but normal. Now, this is my assertion to the viewers. By saying it's really vivid, she's choosing these words. She's telling us, she wants us to believe that her memory is very strong with details. It's not just vivid, it's really vivid. And I believe her. I mean, she was really tired. Now, she is using her own words. We must believe her. We must listen to her. I believe that her memory of that evening is very vivid because her hormones were on super high alert. I believe that Madeline was really tired and that Madeline's tiredness is important to this case enough that she's mentioning it here. We should be listening and believing her. But she just cuddled up on my knee and we read a story. And we also had some treats. This is a portrayal of a really good mom. Okay, now I'm asking the viewers to enter into not reality, but the verbalized perception of reality. <clears throat> She's telling you, my memory was re is really strong for a reason. I believe her. Madeline was really tired, and there's a reason why that's here too. And I'm a really good mom. She has a need to tell us this while her child is missing. Okay? This is often an indication of neglect or abuse. There's a correlation between mothers who, when they go for substance abuse treatment, if a mother says in the in-screening of substance abuse treatment, I'm a really great mom, or portrays it in any way, shape, or form, it's a signal for the the therapist to go into the history and find this mother has been involved with child protective services. Okay. In other words, um, great moms are often too tired to talk about how great they are just from being tired. It's the need to brag is concerning. Now her child is missing. At this point, the self condemnation should be through the roof instead of the boasting. This is not a good sign. Mm -hmm. I, I'm believing her as she's guiding me until we, she talks me out of it. I think, yeah, I think they may have read. I think they may have had some treats. In fact, she's given me um, exact details of the treats because I think she really is vivid memory because the hormones are really high, which is concerning. And then I, what I mentioned earlier about the normal factor, here we go. The usual kind. In other words, it's a normal, usual night. Mm -hmm. The need for her to express that tells us it was anything but. It was anything but. Now, the mentioning of toilet teeth um, is unnecessary. There's any number of things that you do with a child, but she chooses to include these things. These associations in language are often associated with sexual abuse. Right. I, 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 I've heard you say that before, uh, Peter, or read, read that. What, what, that. That seems quite... Sort of, I don't understand why that might be the case. Sure, and it, it does warrant an explanation. I was once um, investigating a robbery, and uh, the employees were asked to write out a statement of what they had done. And one woman wrote, I woke up, brushed my teeth, got dressed, and went to work. And she included the brushing of her teeth. And in statement analysis, we believe what someone tells us. I believe she brushed her teeth. I also know that when people include brushing a teeth in a statement, it's very rare. It's important to her. It's something that we all do, and 90% plus people don't feel necessary to tell us they brushed their teeth. So why would brushing teeth be so important to her? So I spoke to the owner of the business and said, I would like to speak to this young woman about the theft. I said, no, she didn't steal, but I believe she's a victim of domestic violence and she knows who did. And they, the owners were shocked. How could you possibly have known that? We had met with her. She is in a domestically violent relationship. We talked about it. We've been trying to get her out of it, but she won't listen to us. How did you know? I said, because she brushed her teeth. And they thought that that was just crazy. I said, no, what we do is we flag personal hygiene. 
and we ask you to consider what her life is like. Women that are involved in domestically violent relationships are generally not subject to violence. It is the threat of violence that controls them. So in her world, when she gets up in the morning, she goes into the bathroom, she locks the door, and for a few minutes, she feels safe while she's brushing her teeth and tending to herself. Because the rest of her, her life is controlled by him. He might text her at work, he might call her at work, he might control things, and what I think happened there was that she allowed him and his gang to enter access into the building to commit the theft. Brushing a teeth was something so important to her that she mentioned it. So whenever we see personal hygiene where it is unnecessary, we explore for these matters. Now, the idea of sexual abuse comes in with water. Uh, school teacher notices that little Johnny comes to school every day and um, he's always clean. But before every snack or after every snack, we got him to wash his hands. Like all little children, that's just kind of a norm. One day, Johnny comes to school and he washes his hands without being asked and washes them again and washes them again and washes them again. And the teacher says, uh-oh, something's wrong. There's a dramatic change in his behavior and has to do with water. Okay. What they have to, have to explore for is the possibility of sexual abuse. Um, when a child is sexually abused very early on, in the bedroom by a trusted family member, the child's sensory is different. And someone may be 40 years old and say, when I went to the store, I opened the door and went in. You can't go to the store without opening a door. Mm. Why would he mention door? Because in his brain, there is an association with the sound of an opening door that's with him forever. Because the opening of a door sound may be associated with when he was sexually abused or she was sexually abused. So we believe what someone tells us. I believe that, you know, they had this personal hygiene with every three-year-old goes through it. Mm -hmm. But her inclusion is telling me something's wrong. Remember the context also. Her child's missing. She hasn't mentioned a thing about what Madeline's going through, but she's talking about Madeline's hygiene here with detail. Mm -hmm. So um, I believe what she's telling me in that sense but I know there's, there's a reason why she's choosing these words. Then when she says the usual kind, what she's telling you is something unusual happened between her and Madeline that night. Right. Now, right. Right. I, I asked them to consider that. Hmm. Now, go back and listen to her words. My memory of that evening is really vivid. I mean, she was really tired. And I think that investigators should consider the possibility that Madeline was given something that made her very tired so she would sleep and not disrupt the dinner. Mm -hmm. That is not uncommon. Uh, in, in fact, this is somewhat sad to report. I once had to investigate a physician who was accused of drugging children. And he spoke plainly to me and said, I give them cough syrup because their parents are abusive. The state cannot take the parents, the children away from the parents, but I know they're abusive. And by giving them a teaspoon of a type of cough syrup that'll help them sleep, the parent's drug night will not be interrupted and the child won't suffer even more so. Mm -hmm. It was a dreadful decision that he made and, and I, he didn't practice medicine very long after that, uh, as you can probably imagine, but it's something much more common than people would believe. Mm -hmm. We have not only that, but we have a doctor here who would have access to that sort of thing. Mm. An anesthetist as well, she was. She was an anesthetist as well. I didn't realize that. Right. Many examples of, of how this works out. Um, when someone is accused of sexual molesting a child and the man says, I'm a normal, happily married man. Mm. Um, what he's saying is, I don't deny the sexual molestation, but I want you to think I couldn't have done it because I'm married. We're married people, still sexual abuse children. Um, so when the word normal is used, it's an indication, and any word near that, normal, usual, um, regular, when it is used, it means the person is thinking of something unusual, abnormal, not the norm. Mm. 
while they're speaking and they're trying to deceive. Mm -hmm. So here she's revealing a knowledge, if we're listening to her, that this day was what they went through, that routine was not normal. Okay. I also, before we leave this last quote, um, we have, she just cuddled on my knee and we read a story and we also had some treats. The word we is used to connect people. It's a very powerful pronoun. It often uses, uh, speaks of unity. And we do not hear the word we between a murderer and a victim. It's very unusual. What this suggests, um, along with the word cuddled, is something different. The word cuddled, that's what three-year-olds do. It's unnecessary to tell us that. Um, it is persuasive language. She's trying to portray something as being very close, very normal, telling us that something wasn't normal about it. But the word we suggests something to consider, that what happened to Madeline that night may not have been intentional. And so I have to, I am a slave to the statement. The, the words must guide me, and no matter what my opinion may be, um, what I do now is uh, I have indication within the language that there is no concern for Madeline, which we'll explore, that Madeline is not alive at this point, and that they are concealing information about what happened to Madeline, but thus far, um, this is not premeditated. Mm -hmm. This is um, someone who was had a, a, a boundary set up in the family. And the ties that bind them together here produce the word we. Mm -hmm. When you say that night, right, uh, it, the night that uh, something happened, if it happened, mm -hmm. um, are you convinced that it's the night that they said, or, or do you think it could have been a different night, a, pre a previous night? Oh, it, it could be the previous night. This could or, or, or previous, not necessarily the, the date they've said. Yeah. It, That's a very good point, because usual is given. Usual is given. Um, what she could be talking about is patterns, mm -hmm. speaking of patterns. If this child was given something to make her sleep, it wouldn't have been the first time. And that's what that could suggest. Mm -hmm. if, if you've watched my final film, a lot of people think that they spent three days or so uh, before they announced to the public that Madeline had oh, so, yeah. uh, gone missing, that they spent some time planning it. That, that's a, um, well, it's, 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 all, it's all covered in my, in my final film, basically. But what, what we looked at was, we went back in time from the point where they alerted the police to, to try and find evidence of her being alive in photographs and all kinds of all kinds of things. So there is a school of thought that she died on the 29th of April, which was three days before they even reported her missing. So I don't know. Have you not watched that final film? I haven't yet. Right. Okay. All right. Right now, it's not supported by the language. But the reason I mention it is because what I do is I have to be open to anything that comes in, and what I'll say is the language will affirm that. The language will deny that, or the language won't address it. It's called a temporal lacunae, a jump over in time. And at this point, I don't see a deliberate attempt to jump time. Okay. And if it comes up later, I'll, I'll grab it, but I don't see it at this point. All right. At 9 p.m., Jerry checked on Madeline and the twins. I actually stuck my head around the door, and, and I just lingered for a few seconds and thought how beautiful she was. Um, and that's that was... the last time I saw. This is very concerning. This is a, a statement that bothers me a great deal. First of all, he begins with the pronoun I, which is, means psychologically he's putting himself there. This is good. We want him to be there. We want to have reliable information. But the next word is actually. The word actually means he's comparing what he's claiming to do with something else. Why would that be necessary at this point? Then I'd actually stuck my head around the door and I, I just lingered for a few seconds and thought how beautiful she was um, and that was the last time I saw her. At this point, his child is missing, not dead, according to their narrative. 
even though he's referencing a specific night, is Madeline no longer beautiful? And I, what I asked of you is to consider that when you give a detail of a past tense event, the details should be in the past tense appropriately. When you speak about character or ongoing characteristics of a missing child, it should be present tense. And I thought, how beautiful she is. And that's the last time I saw her. That would be more acceptable. This is a past tense reference to Madeline herself, not specifically bound up to a detail, um, but actually, was she only beautiful that night? That's what I mean by an attribute. So when someone uses an attribute of a missing child in the past tense, it's not a good signal. Right. It's not a good signal at all. Now, he also stuttered with the pronoun I. So what we look for is that does he normally stutter? And he doesn't. He's not a stutterer. The pronoun I is something that we in the English language use millions of times. We are as good at using the pronoun I as we could be as good at anything in, in this life. When someone stutters on the pronoun I, there is an increase in tension and anxiety. And this stutter bothers me here. And it's important. He's talking about his daughter in the context she's still missing. So while you know, the several things are wrong, he gives a narrative or an emotion. He references her beauty, which should be ongoing, and it's not. And he stutters on the pronoun I. And I still wait to hear concern for what Madeline is going through while this interview is being conducted. And mm -hmm. that's going to be a bigger point as we move forward. Yeah. Excuse me. The last time someone sees a missing child is always going to be important. Right. This may sound um, a bit strange. But I believe him. I believe that the last time he saw her, he did linger. And he did think about how beautiful she was. I think this is where she was disposed of. And I'll, I'll build right. this theme as we go along. All right. The last time he saw her, mm. you thought how lucky you were. Exactly. And that bothered me because that's very poor interviewing. That's why we train journalists to not teach someone how to lie. Mm -hmm. um, because the, the problem with that is he did not think about how lucky he was unless something was wrong. And that's, it, it, I can't say that, the, that he thought how lucky I was. He only affirms it from what the interviewer said. The interviewer should not have said such a thing. The interviewer is speaking as if the interviewer believes the child is dead. Um, if you have no guilty knowledge of your missing child and you leave the child to go to dinner, you're not going to have that type of nostalgic thoughts. You're just going to dinner and, you know, we'll, we'll miss her and we'll be back in shortly and it'll be, everything will be fine. You don't have those type of thoughts. Mm -hmm. Having those type of thoughts is an indication of guilty knowledge that Madeline's gone. Your world was shattered uh, within an hour. We now have a period of time, and we also have uh, a case of distancing language where he didn't say, my world is shattered. If my daughter was missing, my world is shattered. Not your world, not someone else's world, not everyone's world because everyone experiences this universally. My world is shattered. I'm the father. What's going on with Madeline right now? No concern. Uh, what I'm building towards is this. There's a reason why the McCanns do not show any concern over what Madeline's experiencing right now. They're intelligent people. They're no, they're no dummies here. They're intelligent people. They're not concerned. Parents are forever concerned because um, even Stephen King said, the terrors that a parent's mind can conjure up in wondering what my children are going through is more horrible than anything he could write. Mm -hmm. Our imaginations double down on us when we try to sleep, worrying about every little slip, every little fall of our children go through. They have shown no concern 
in the most extreme of circumstances, why not? And they're going to answer that question for me. So Jerry, as a biological father, is telling us that his world isn't shattered. Your world is. That's distancing language. At 10 p.m., it was Kate's turn to look in on the kids. At that point, I expect to hear, I got there and Madeline was gone. That's, uh, it's not a discovery. It is a traumatic, personal, up-close personal, extreme event that puts hormone levels so high that if they don't recede quickly, there's going to be PTSD. In other words, the hormonal response of finding your child missing is going to be so extreme that in a few moments, you're not going to be able to reason the emotions down, the, the hormones down. If you're driving your car, and as you're driving, someone cuts you off, and you grab your wheel, and you can feel the flush of hormones. You feel it physically. It's a physiological reaction. You say to yourself, I'm okay, and your hands begin to um, loosen. The blood goes back towards the, the blood flow that initially went out to protect you, and the hormones recede in just a few moments, maybe a second or two, maybe even less than a second. If that hormonal response were to stay elevated for more than a few seconds, it is very likely that 30 years from now you're going to wake up screaming because it, the brain is, has an imprint on it. If you walk through the door and found your child missing, the hormonal response is so extreme and there's no reasoning it down, that parent will suffer for the rest of the parent's life, even if the child is found safely a week later. 30 years later, the parent will still wake up screaming because the imprint on the brain, the inability for the brain to process the most powerful of human emotions, a mother-child bonding, it can't happen properly. And so we can mitigate it by trying to get them to process it. Journaling is, is very helpful, but it is so intense. And that's why the the vividness is so powerful and it's physiological. When you're under attack, when something like that happens, your um, eyes will, pupils will dilate, you go on high alert, blood will flow to and from certain parts of your body, your legs will become stronger so you can run, um, the blood goes away from the internal organs so that if you're knifed, you have a better chance of surviving. Um, the hairs, people say the hair on the back of my neck stood up, it's actually true, a pilo erection it's called. It is some kind of built-in mechanism to make us look bigger and stronger. Those are the type of reactions that you will have if you find, or I will have, if I find my child being missing. She tells us I had that type of reaction with the conclusion that um, everything was normal. You can't have it both ways. This is a disconnect that, that means she's not speaking from experiential memory. She's using certain points of the account, stitching it together, in an overall deceptive account. The bedroom door where the three children were sleeping was open much further than we'd left it. I went to close it to about here and then as I got to here it suddenly slammed and then as I opened it it was then that I just thought I'd just look at the children and literally as I went back in the curtains of the bedroom which were drawn were closed it was like a gust of wind kind of just blew them open. This is not a sophisticated liar. This is a silly story where my child is missing and I'm talking about the curtains and blowing and, and all sorts of emotions. That's where um, someone who is a police officer, even without terrific training, will say, this is storytelling. This is storytelling. Well, we call it narrative building. And what she's doing is she's giving uh, the inclusion of emotions besides many other indicators of, of problems within the house, including the door. Um, the bedroom door where the three children, the three children, not my kids, that's distancing language there, were sleeping, was open much further than I'd left it. That's not what she says. We left it. Does that mean that she and her husband each took a hand and move the door to a certain level together? Because that's what she wants me to believe. Mm -hmm. She's lying. Mm -hmm. This is deception. The fact that she's using door for deception um, is because she's building a narrative about 
a kidnapping. The need to build the narrative about kidnapping says the child wasn't kidnapped. That, that plainly. And literally, as I went back in, the curtains of the bedroom, which were drawn, were closed. It was like a gust of wind blew upon them. She's asking you to enter into an emotional, fictitious account. This is the writing of fiction. Um, this is something that even Statement Analysis 101 would be able to grab on. Mm -hmm. So I conclude here, deception indicated from this alone. And you mention here again, doors and windows are often found within language of sexual abuse. Yeah, I'm concerned. Right. I'm concerned. Um, this is not a normal family. There are verbal indicators, and, and it doesn't necessarily mean that Madeline was a victim of sexual abuse. What it could be is in the language of Kate that she was sexually abused while she was growing up. This would leave her vulnerable um, for things such as neglect. That's, and if you take that the next step, someone that has been sexually abused in childhood who is now vulnerable to neglecting her own children, possibly fail, even failure to protect if, if uh, someone else like her husband was involved in sexual abuse, we would find the need to persuade us, I'm a great mom. We were cuddling. Okay? The reason I don't, I, I indicated deception with that statement about cuddling is because um, whenever someone says, we call it the I love you factor. I kissed my kids, told them I love them and went to bed. Everyone kisses their kids and says, I love you, go to bed. When you see that in a criminal statement, they're telling you something is really wrong between me and the kids. So her need to persuade about the cuddling, if you consider it carefully, you must be open to the fact that she may have been holding a lifeless body and has a need to persuade, no, this was cuddling. Okay. Um. This answer, by the way, was one of the most important answers because here we were able to look at the larger measurement of the statement of what happened as she gets into it. And this is a very lengthy introduction. She's not getting to the point of telling us that Madeline is missing and what must she be going through. She is narrative building, of, of, even if we just measured it with the scientific measurement of our formula of 25% introduction, 50% content 25% afterwards, she is heavily delaying getting to the point and giving lots of unnecessary details. Mm -hmm. Where do we have more detail? On what Madeline is going through or on the windows? And the curtains which have been closed just swung open into the room and reveal that the shutter was all the way up and the window being pushed right across. And then I just knew, I just knew she'd been taken. Right. She goes to a conclusion of the matter, and she goes into present tense language. Um, this is an intelligent woman. She knows how to use verb tenses. When someone is committed to something that happened, I came to the building, not I come to the building. Well, here we have a continued description about the curtains, um, which is, is concerning to me, just swung open into the room and reveal that the shutter was all the way up. So it, if we want to believe what she's going to say is that the reason that she knows that someone had been taken her is because she walked into the room and, and the room just did magically opened itself up and said, look, look at the evidence. Um, she's lying. Okay. This tells us Madeline was not kidnapped. Okay. Kate says after a quick, frantic search of the apartment, she ran back towards Jerry, who was still with their friends at the table by the pool. I remember exactly where the table was. It's kind of in this bit. So it'd be about round here. And uh, I was kind of sitting in this bit. Yeah, I mean, Kate's clearly distraught, and I jumped up. But it's kind of disbelief. She can't be gone. She can't, she can't possibly. How could she be gone? And I've seen that to Kate as we were both running. Deception indicated, and here's why. First of all, we have him making an, ass, uh, uh, an assertion. I know where the table was. I know exactly where the table was. So he's giving us an indication, I am on high alert. The same what she had done before. And then, with this precise language, he immediately moves away from it. 
it was kind of, he now qualifies it, this bit, so it would be about around here. And I was kind of sitting in this bit. So going from this exact, this is a, a form of self-censoring. He is stopping himself from going to this precise way um, he has a need to conceal. He then describes his wife's emotion. Kate was clearly distraught. Now consider this. If your child is missing, you're going to be distraught. Telling us that she's distraught is narrative. It's not necessary to say. I didn't think that she stopped to smoke a cigarette and to look at how beautiful the stars were in the sky. Of course she'd be distraught. Telling us that she was distraught is unnecessary, therefore it's very important. But he now looks to persuade me. Not only was she distraught, but she was clearly distraught. In other words, her affect of being distraught was beyond any debate. So I, I want you to know that when my child was missing, my wife was really, really, really upset. That's goofy. And that's what this is. It's a need to persuade. That sounds, to the average listener, that sounds goofy. And I jumped up. You know, we did not think that you stopped for a cigarette. We did not think you said, okay, let me have dessert first. This is also unnecessary language. And then he says, kind of disbelief. I believe him. Because he knows it's not true. He knows what he's doing is, is narrative telling. And so the first thing he's going to say is, where is she? We must find her. No, she can't be gone. She can't. She can't possibly be. How can she be gone? This is an important part for your viewing audience to understand. Guilty people will ask questions. They are looking to see what answers are out there. They're looking for responses from even the interviewer, from police, from the audience. They're floating their alibis to see, will you agree? The first thing that anyone would say if your child was missing is, where is she? Not how can this happen? No, that this can't be happening. No, we don't even reach denial stage yet. As a father or mother, the first thing we do is, no, I'm going to find her. She wandered out. The door was open. She's out here. Let's get her. They know that she didn't wander out. So he artificially not only imputes his emotions into this part of the statement, he artificially inflates both of their emotions. Um, the fact that he says that he had to do something immediately, uh, and I jumped up, I jumped up. It itself is unnecessary. Of course, any father's gonna jump up. He has a need to persuade us. He might, at this point, be reliving the emotions, I'm sorry, the, the motions that he went through in this. So he, he gives us, he wants, he wants us to think that he's in denial. She can't, she can't possibly be, be what? He stopped himself, be dead? How can she be gone is a question. And I said that to Kate, no. And I was saying that to Kate as we were both running. Now this is also interesting and it, and it may be a little bit overkill, but this is what analysts do. We would take this short answer and analyze it for hours. And I will, just one small point here. And I was saying that to Kate as we were running. Nope. As I was saying that to Kate as we were both running. He has a need to persuade that both were in earnest. Both were upset. Both were um, in emergency mode. Because they weren't. Those that are in emer emergency mode don't even need to tell us they're in emergency mode. But they certainly don't need to persuade us. His need to persuade that they were in emergency mode tells us this was not unexpected, this was not an emergency. Richard, he's lying. Okay. Police were called within 15 minutes, but they didn't arrive for nearly an hour. It took them another two hours before they bothered to seal off Madeline's bedroom. British investigators later called it the worst preserved crime scene they'd ever encountered. Roadblocks and checks weren't put on Portugal's borders for a full 12 hours. And within days, hundreds of guests, potential witnesses and suspects had checked out and left without ever having been interviewed. Now, I can't defend what the police did or didn't do I don't know it, I didn't work with them, I have no association with them, but I do ask your viewing audience to consider that it is very possible that the initial investigators 
didn't believe they needed to do any of those things. Yeah. I'd like you to consider this. I know exactly where that table was. And then he stumbles over to exactly where the table was. Why would he give such an unnecessary detail? Why would we care where the table was located? Um, in resisting interrogations, Navy SEALs use a tactic. If an enemy takes a Navy SEAL, the Navy SEAL is taught to resist the interrogation by giving enough truthful details of something irrelevant to satisfy the interrogators. Mm. And so a Navy SEAL is captured and he talks about how he dives and cleans the ship. And he gives such details that the interrogators think this idiot is someone's job is just to clean the ship. And he's gone on and on and on about every detail of what, how he does it and how long he's underwater, what tools he uses, nothing to find here. Jerry shows a stronger or a more efficient level of sophistication and deception in this manner. This is, in fact, what you had mentioned earlier in your question. This is a form of diversion. He is safely going in to describe a table because that's a safe thing to say. We call this leakage. He knows what happens, or, or I'll say it this way. The brain knows what happened. He now has to go into the brain and talk about what happened but not give it away. It's really difficult because he might choose some of the wrong words by accident. So he focuses on a table and then he stumbles on it because it's such a ridiculous point. He's using a diversion tactic because it's necessary. So what we do is we say, well, here's a diversion tactic. Why would the dad of a missing little girl need to make such effort to divert attention away from what happened? The night seemed so long, every second is it was excruciating and it was dark and you just want there to be light and everybody searching and Madeline found. Okay, this particular statement itself is very concerning. First of all, we'd ask the question, for whom was this night so long and so excruciating for? For Kate. Or if we want to listen to her words, it was not even for Kate, it was for you. Listen to what she says, believe what she says. The night seemed so long, every second was excruciating, and it was dark, and you just want there to be light. Not, not she, not her as a mother. Um, but by the way, was it excruciating for Madeline to be taken? She shows concern for you or herself, and nothing for the child. A parental instinct is so powerful that we've used it in judicial courts since time out of mind. Going back to the Solomonic courts uh, of your Bible lessons, where two women gave birth to children and one woman rolled over and suffocated the child. And they each claimed custody of the living child, neither wanted custody of the dead child. And it went all the way to Solomon's court. And people who know the story said Solomon said, um, bring me a sword, cut the living child in half, and give them each half their baby. Solomon had no intention of committing murder. What Solomon had done was repeated both women's arguments. The woman who actually gave birth to the child said, let her, the liar, have the child. Let my child live. And everyone was able to see that's really the mother. He was exploiting maternal instinct. Prior to that, he simply repeated their arguments. And if we listen very carefully, especially as it, it comes out in Hebrew, it's, it's very simple. This mother says, the dead child is hers, the living child is mine. She mentioned the dead child first. That's what people do. They mention their own first. But this mother says, no, the living child is mine, the dead child is hers. She mentioned the living child first because that's her child. When no one understood that, when no one was listening to the order of which someone spoke, then Solomon called for the sword and said, cut the baby in half and give them each half, without any intention of murder. The maternal instinct came forward, everyone knew. They would have known before the sword was taken if they just listened to each mother. So I ask you to listen to this mother, and listen to her carefully. The night seemed so long, for whom? Every second was excruciating, for whom? It was dark, and you just want there to be light. Okay, let's find out what you want. Let's look at the order. You want there to be light, you want everybody searching, and you want Madeline found. 
Her priority is light for you, everybody searching, and Madeline found. Madeline is the last thing in her priority. As a matter of fact, this statement shows that someone was living in excruciating pain. Someone was living in excruciating uh, length of time, impatience. But here is where we expect her to, to show what Madeline is going through. Where is her teddy bear? Where is her favorite blanket? Where is her favorite toy? Not a single word of concern. Now, why would she give last in her priority Madeline being found? I ask your audience to consider she doesn't want Madeline found. Any parent, innocent parent, would want that first and foremost. She instead turns the lights, and, and that would be more further insight psychologically into their own thinking. But her order tells us that the last in her priority is having Madeline found. We also see that the emotion that's used is narrative, but it's also focused towards her. However, in the, the pronoun you, even that she doesn't take ownership of. I think it was an excruciating night, and I think that her concern for herself is genuine because this is what I'm building towards. Mm -hmm. There's no concern for Madeline by a biological mother and by a biological father because Madeline is dead. Madeline is beyond concern. Madeline is beyond help. There's no more fretting or worrying for Madeline. And that's what's in this statement. Mm -hmm. Is Madeline crying? Does she have her favorite teddy bear? Is she getting her meds? Is she calling out for me, the mother? Is Madeline in excruciating pain? What must Madeline be experiencing in the hands of strangers? These are all things that were not in their language. Yeah. And this is consistent. This is not just one interview. These people have always been focused upon themselves. They have always given an indication that Madeline will not be found alive, if found at all, and that Madeline being found is not something they want to happen. Mm -hmm. Their concern is always for themselves because Madeline doesn't need concern any longer. The past tense reference is one thing that indicates death, but this is the most powerful part of the analysis, is that they're telling us Madeline is dead. Now, I know that, that people wondered if there was a kidnapping, if they were sold into um, sex rings, child sex rings, and these things do exist. That's not what's in the parent's language. So I, I can only say what's in that language. And I'm letting them guide me. I'm letting them dictate to me my opinion by the words that they're choosing. And they're actually going to give us more detail. Mm -hmm. Richard, they're going to confess. You think so? Oh, oh you, you mean in the subtext of the, of, the, of the interview? You don't mean literally, do you? They're, in, the, in this statement, we're going to see what we call a statement analysis confession. Right. They actually admit us to us what happened. Did you kill your daughter? No. That's an emphatic no. I mean, the ludicrous thing is... Um, what I suppose what's being purported from Portugal is that Madeline died in the apartment by an accident and we hid her body. Well, when did she have the accident and died? Because the only time she was left unattended was when we were at dinner. So if she died then, how could we have disposed or hidden her body? You know, when there was an immediate search. It's just nonsense. So, and if she died when we were in the apartment or fell and did, why would we? Why would we cover that up? And this is what we call the embedded confession. This is where a guilty party will put together in their own language what happened. And we need to listen and believe them. We also have the principle of them asking questions. This is very important. They're asking questions to find out how their answers will be responded to. Will it be ridicule? Would it be acceptance? Will it sound sane? would help get them off the hook. Listen very carefully to what they say. It's a yes or no question. Did you kill your daughter? No is a good answer. And what, what I teach investigators to do is when someone is asked a yes or no question is to count on their fingers the number of words following the word no. No. That's an emphatic no. And obviously it goes into the point where it goes beyond your 10 fingers. When it goes that long, very simply speaking, there is a need to persuade. So the no is not going to stand on itself. If he said no, 
I didn't kill my daughter, and I'm telling you the truth, this would be something very strong. And we'd have to ask about her. And we'd also have to ask, did something cause your daughter's death? That sort of thing. But here, no. That's an emphatic no. The first thing we know about his denial is that his denial, from his perspective, needs some help. It's weak. That's an emphatic no. So the first thing is no, okay, an emphatic no. My no needs emphasis. Why does it need to be emphasis? There's one. I mean, the ludicrous thing is um, what I suppose what's been purported from Portugal is that Madeline died in the apartment by accident and we hit her body. Okay. What he tells us here is Madeline died in the apartment, his words, by an accident, which would support the pronoun we that we heard between mother and child, and we hit her body. I believe him. The reason I say this is an embedded confession is because he is not entering any other language. He's not quoting anyone. For instance, if I said, well, you said that I killed her. That's not an embedded confession because I'm actually quoting you. Here, he's not, not only is he not quoting anyone, he's only saying what's been purported, not even an accusation. And we need to be listening to him. This now tells me, as an analyst, Madeline died in the apartment. So I know from their language thus far that Madeline is not alive. They are in need of an alibi. The death was not intended. And the location of the death is in the apartment. And again, by accident. And then I know something else now. I know that we hid the body. Jerry and his wife, um, sorry, the, the two mechanics together, they worked together to hide her body. Then he goes into questions. And this is where um, guilty parties are looking to see what a response is. They want, they're, they, they're disguised as rhetorical questions, but they want to see what people respond to them as. This takes place even in the interview process. Well, when did she have the accident and died? Okay, what they want to know is, do people know the exact time of death? Because the only time she was left unattended, she was left unattended is not the only time we left her. He's now removing himself from that. Left unattended is passive was when we, which shows unity between him, uh, him and his wife, were at dinner. So if she died then, which this is, a, we call this an allowance. The father of a missing child is allowing for a scenario that denial will not allow. There's no natural denial. He's saying if she died then, not even, not even if she was dead, which is itself a red flag, but now about a specific time, how could we have disposed, uh, hidden her body? The word disposed and then hidden, the change there, actually shows respect for Madeline. It's a softer terminology. Not dump the body. And, not, and he even changes dispose, a self-correction, from disposed to hidden. He now tells us that they didn't dispose the body. They actually hid it. This is why, and this confirms um, the priority. We want there to be light. We want there to be searching. By the way, we also want them to find Madeline. But it's last on my, mm -hmm. my list of priorities. So I now know that Madeline is dead. Madeline died in the apartment. And listen to his questions. When did we do this? How did we do this? You know, when there's an immediate, it's just nonsense, self-censoring again. And if she died when we were in the apartment or fell and died, why would, we, why would we cover that up? Okay, That's the most important question he asks. So he now introduces something else that may have happened. Madeline fell. I am concerned and remain concerned that Madeline may have been drugged in any way, shape, or form, whether it be nighttime cough syrup or something more, so that these people could go and have their dinner and their party and get their break and all that, that Madeline awoke 
and fell and got injured. And the injury was beyond. Yeah. Can I just interject with a question, Peter? Sure. When, when he's saying, um, he's, he, he's alluding to the fact that he doesn't think they would have had time on that particular evening to deal with the body. Could that suggest that there's been pre-planning and the meal was orchestrated to allow for a window for their phantom abductor? And he's confident that he can show the audience that there's not enough time for them to have done that. So in other words, it's possibly happened on a previous time. Yes, it, would, it wouldn't, it is possible. And, uh, and this, the focus on time, which he doubles up on, opens that door up now for us. Right. We have to consider it. Um, intention it hasn't changed. In other words, that this death was not intended is not changed by this. But the fact that they do, or he does, in his language, focus so much on time, we must now be open to the possibility that he has a confidence about this time frame because it happened at a different time frame. So the answer is yes. Okay. What he's doing is he's affirming every other point of analysis. So when I said earlier that we look at little point here, little point there, he's now summed it up for us. The reason why this father does not show any concern about what Madeline is going through is because Madeline is beyond experiencing anything that he would need to be, be concerned about. Mm -hmm. They hid her body. Right. That's what they did according to his language. But I, I don't think we should dismiss quickly that he introduced falling. Mm -hmm. She was very tired, Kate said. Mm -hmm. um, they had left her for their own. And so he asked the question, why would we cover this up? Mm -hmm. And the answer is quite simple. We have professional people who have two other children, an unintentional, unintentional death. You're going to lose custody of the children. Mm -hmm. uh, another motive might be if there had been signs of abuse. Yes. Um, that would come up in a, you know, the, the hospital. In the inquiry, sure. Yeah. Um, he, as, medical, as a medical professional, in any way, they are very likely to have knowledge of child abuse because it's just part of that profession where they deal with that. Um, now, we have some indications there that would need much further exploration for possible sexual abuse. And there is a risk of the consequences for an unintended death, that's number one. Risk of losing the other children, number two. And then as you point out, um, when Child Protective Services sends in a professional to investigate, every case is explored for sexual abuse, whether there's allegations or not. Mm. All indicators of all possible abuses are explored for. Neglect, physical abuse, emotional abuse, sexual abuse are going to be explored for in every case. Because we have some linguistic indicators, which could be them as parents, it could be them as abusers, it could be him as an abuser, it could be her failure to protect, we have to explore for it. Right. Um, the consequences could go on more than just losing custody of the twins. Mm -hmm. It could be lose, loss of freedom. Yeah. When a guilty person asks questions, they're floating out alibis, they're looking to, to see what sounds um, plausible, and in his Question, he says, well, when did she have the accident, not a accident, the accident, and died? The only time she was left unattended was when we were at dinner. So, which is establishing his alibi, if she died then, how could we have disposed of hidden her body? Now, it's interesting, when some people ask questions like that, they don't always get the answers they want to hear. We have here in the United States a baseball player who was accused of using performance-enhancing drugs, named Roger Clemens. And under oath, he said, if I have all these performance-enhancing drugs, it would mean that someone supplied them. Who is this? Who supplied them? I wish he would come forward. So he asked who supplied them, and then he made a wish. The man who, who supplied him with performance-enhancing drugs came forward and fulfilled his wish and testified against him. So, uh, as by asking a question, they're trying to portray it as if it's not plausible while they're giving out information and admitting what happened. Mm -hmm. This is an embedded confession and statement analysis. This is not the quote of someone else accusing them. This is what was purported to come out from Portugal. 
what he's saying to you is Portugal, Portugal police know. So they may make various statements, but the investigators on the ground, if we were to talk to them, the ones that first responded, they would tell you exactly what they feel about this case, and I think it would be right here, mm -hmm. that it's a cover-up. And that gets yeah. even more ludicrous, that we've obviously hidden her somewhere incredibly well, where nobody's found her. I believe what she's telling me. I believe that, um, first of all, the word obvious means to accept without question, and I am following it. That we've obviously, it's obvious to, and this is a concern of hers, that people recognize they've hidden her somewhere incredibly well where nobody's found her. Now, consider this. This is supposed to be from a mother of a missing child who is spending a lot of time defending herself, trying to ridicule the accusations, instead of pleading for her safe return and talking about what she's going through. Mm -hmm. Again, there is no concern for what Madeline is going through by biological parents, close relatives, the closest relatives. And we had well. her so well that we then decided we'd move her in the car, which we hired weeks later. And, you know, it's just ridiculous. So now we have a change of language from ludicrous to ridiculous. We have a car entering her language. And the timing um, is not lost on us either. She now says weeks later. So if someone was concerned that the death took place at a different time, she's now saying, you've got a good idea to be concerned about that. She's playing with the time. Mm -hmm. So uh, to, to narrow down the time frame to what they want us to think it is would not be a wise investigatory move. We'd have to be open to other, other time here. Does that include uh, the death occurring before the, 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 their stated time, the, 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 the time they say Madeline was abducted? It, it has to go beyond the time that they state. It has to, right. because, because their, their words are guiding, at least from my perspective as a statement analyst, they're not locking in a time frame. Mm -hmm. um, by, by choosing three weeks is to deliberately blur. Um, it's kind of a, a, a joke, but it's a statistical uh, point, is that when someone is going to choose a number and they need to lie about it, they often will cling to number three. Mm -hmm. um, Two sounds too small, four sounds too big, and it just it's one of those statistical yeah. uh, patterns. They, they, they did hire a car after they'd reported her missing a few weeks after. Mm -hmm. So that's what she's referring to there. And, and there was evidence found in the car yes. uh, of a cat of a dog evidence, I believe. Yep. The, the point being is that as she even goes to this area, she's changing the time frame for us. Right. So even if three is accurate, Right. It's still fascinating that she is now moving the time away from what they originally said. Right. So it's sensitive to her. Right, I see. When you come back to Portugal, do you feel closer to Madeline? And although I don't know where Madeline is, that is the last place that you know, I saw her and held her. And I guess it's a part of me that still feels connected to her there. So. This was an interesting question. And I thought for an interview that I did not think very highly of, this was a fascinating question that grabbed my attention. And I think the interviewer might be probing for what we actually get here, is her answer is important. Although I don't know where Madeline is, no one accused you of that. So before she even gets to her emotion, she has a need to deny that she knows where Madeline is. You know what that tells me? She cool. knows where Madeline is. Right. Um, that she's actually affirming that we hid her incredibly well. These two smart people who were in panic mode for themselves hid her incredibly well. So although I don't know where Madeline is, we call that um, the negation. She wants us to know what she doesn't know. Um, very sensitive. And then she uses the phrase, you know. And what we do with a, any type of habit of speech is we look where it comes up and where it doesn't come up. And it shows an acute awareness of the interviewer. So we notice what topics will provoke that, what topics do not provoke it. And about the location of Madeline, it provoked it. And then she says, and I think this is um, important, I saw her, held her. Now, in order to, to hold her, you have to see her. Seeing her is unnecessary. 
people speak that way about dead people, about dead family members. Because in order to hold her, you have to see her, unless you held a dead body. I think that when Madeline's lifeless body was carried, Kate held her. I think she's telling the truth. I think kids can be written off, you know, missing kids can be written off too easily. You cannot do that. You cannot give up on a child. This is the mother of a missing child utterly avoiding the call to find her child, utterly avoiding the call to attention of what Madeline is suffering through. Instead, this is extreme distancing. I don't want Madeline written off. I want her found. No, kids, general, can be written off. You know, again, that awareness of the interviewer. Missing kids, no, my Madeline. Missing kids can be written off. This is someone who has well moved beyond the, in the grieving stage. She has well processed the information. Madeline's not coming home, and she's at peace with it now. This is um, a distancing language of kids, kids, child. The use of the word child there again is something that, you know, we don't say kid abuser, kid molester. We say child abuse, child molester. This use of the word child, although it's not conclusionary by itself, with the other indicators, causes me to, con to be concerned that Madeline was a victim of child abuse inside that home. I don't know for, for certain. There are certain things that I do and can, uh, can say that with a strong conclusion. Um, that's a, an element that must be explored. Right. Just as an aside, uh, Peter, are, are you aware of the, what we call the Gasper statements? This was statements that a family uh, or a couple made um, against the McCanns um, not long after it happened. Are, are you aware of that? No. Okay. Oh, perhaps I can show you that at some point. But um, th they, they had been on holiday with the McCanns about a year earlier or at a previous time. They were sat around the dinner table and the wife was in between Jerry and Jerry's friend and Jerry was discussing with uh, David Payne. He said something like, he actually said, would, sorry, no, it was David Payne said, would Madeline do this? And he put, his, he, he put his finger in his mouth and moved it in and out while circling his nipple, okay? Yeah. David Payne said, uh, and, and Jerry didn't seem phased by that question. Yeah. So after this couple found out... About, We're more phased by the question, my own reaction to that. Yeah, yeah. So after this couple found out that, you know, that this case was going on, they went to Leicestershire Police and reported this. In fact, the, 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 they wouldn't allow their child to be bathed by either Jerry or David Payne after they heard this because um, they, 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 that was another thing that they've spent time bathing each other's children okay which I mean I don't I don't know if that's normal I, I mean I don't think it is um, but uh, so but that that them going to report that in the UK was withheld the, the British police didn't send it to the Portuguese police investigation until the lead investigator had been sacked so that only surfaced and the Portuguese new investigation team ignored it because they basically we think there's a political decision being made to pull the investigation mm -hmm. but yeah the, just a point that there's other um, statement evidence that Jerry might be involved in abuse even though you've not even seen that right the concerns are in the language and I didn't know that right but they're in the language they rely upon an infant's uh, natural sucking mechanism of survival, the the right. one of the that's one of the methods of sexual exploitation of a child. So right. that that motion that that he made, right. Um, right, that would certainly fit into the language. Then kids are survivors. Jerry says kids are survivors. He doesn't tell us Madeline's a survivor. He follows the same vein. What they're doing is psychologically they are. They're gone. They're distancing themselves from Madeline. That she doesn't exist. And in the statement, and this is why it's so important to consider, it's not just that they show no concern about Madeline. We have to enter into their language. We have to go into their world. Um, the reason they're not concerned about Madeline is because she's beyond concern. She doesn't exist any longer. So it's natural for them to talk about kids being survivors and kids doing this, or you feeling that, or you feeling this. Um, 
because they're, they've already processed it. It's gone. You know, Madeline means tower of strength. Wherever she is, whoever she's been with, whatever's happened, we will get her through it. Okay. Um, my transcript says, you know, Madeline means tower of strength. Wherever she was, wherever she, she's been with, whatever's happened, we will get her through it. Um, several things. She doesn't tell us that Madeline is a tower of strength. She doesn't say that she has any strength. She doesn't show any detailed concern for Madeline. And she says, we will get her through it, which is a, a form of passivity. Um, after saying that Madeline, the name means strength but we will get her through it. There's a disconnect there in language, um, which is more narrative storytelling, almost poetic. We'd find that on a, on a card of someone well after death. You will not rest until you find your daughter, until you wrap your arms around her. Why do they say such things as a journalist? Why feed information to a subject that way? It makes no sense. Yeah. I don't believe any parent could, you know, and I don't believe we could ever reach a point where we just think, oh, well, we've done everything now, you know. Whilst the situation remains as it is, you know, Madeline's out there and she needs us to find her. Mm -hmm. You'll keep looking forever. We will. This is, uh, again, another indication that the processing of information has been complete. She tells us what she doesn't believe, tells us what doesn't happen. I don't believe any parent could, and I don't believe we ever could, reach a point, and this is her language, I believe her, we just think, oh, well, we've done everything now, you know. I think that we've hidden her incredibly well. We've done everything now. Her death wasn't intended. Um, we've moved on. So while Madeline's plight, while Madeline's pain, while Madeline's suffering is there, no, while the situation remains, it's a situation. Madeline is no longer part of the picture. There's a situation, and those in situation involved in it are she and her husband. For them, it's a situation. It is not a trauma. Mm -hmm. This is very soft language. The situation remains. Not Madeline's not been found. And you know, Madeline's out there. Do you notice that she avoids saying anything about the person that has her? Or the people that have her. So not only do we not have any connection, but even if they had been guided by law enforcement, they would be speaking to the kidnappers. Mm -hmm. They would be seeking to provoke empathy or some reason to bring her back. Now, she's just out there in the passive voice. That, again, is another indication they don't, they're not concerned. Madeline's beyond, beyond the need of their concern. What's the last thing she says? She needs us to find her. You keep looking forever. Okay, and um, I can't help but wonder if the interviewer thought they're going to be like what we call the O.J. Simpson searching for the real killer. O.J. said he was going to search for the rest of his life for the real killer. He had no confidence it was going to happen any time right. before that. Right. Um, instead of saying we're going to search until she's found, um, it's just going to be, we'll keep looking, you know, forever. Yeah. You, you mentioned um, baby Ayla here, uh, Peter, in relation to this. Baby a a Ayla, A-Y-L-A. -A. Yes. You, have, you said, have you mentioned that? Baby Ayla, not in the yeah. here, but right. in the analysis. Right. Okay. Do you want to mention that now? Sure. Um, baby Ayla was in Waterville, Maine, and she was reported kidnapping by her father. And the father was not cooperating with police, and the family was the, um, the mother, because they're not married, was trying to get the father to speak. And she finally told media that um, the father is not cooperating with police. This got a response from him. Liars are always concerned about their reputation. He, he said, contrary to rumors floating around out there, I have been cooperating with police. And so with the phrase, rumors, floating around out there is a strong indication that baby's in water. And that's where the, the searching went on. He had, um, was asked, how did you do on your polygraph? He had been accused of low level drug dealing, uh, child abuse, other things. He answered, I smoked it. 
I smoked it. So we give ourselves away by the words that we choose. And mm -hmm. There is like a, a, almost like a junior high school student talking about a test. I smoked my math test. It's a missing child. He referenced her in the past tense. He never showed concern at any given time for anything that the child may have been experiencing. All his concern was about himself. This is the same of the McCanns. It's very similar. And when we listen to people and follow their language and their concern is making sure they ridicule instead of deny any possibility of their, their involvement, that's what their priority is. But we went through this interview and not once did I hear a single word of human empathy expressed for Madeline. Mm -hmm. Not once. Madeline is the victim. And if, if the deception was to be believed, someone had Madeline. And was she wearing a warm coat on a, on a cool night? Anything, even the slightest bit of concern, none of that is in their radar because it's not in their hearts. It's not in their minds. It's not in their minds because they know that Madeline is beyond all help. What I concluded from just this interview itself is that Madeline is dead. The death was not intentional. That they have disposed of her remains in a hidden manner of which they feel confident will not be found. The cause of death was likely not intended and may have included both causing her to be very sleepy and a fall. They have feared being accused, their concerns about themselves, and that the time frame that they've given must be questioned. Those are, are things that I conclude strongly. Now, underneath that is um, the possibility of sexual abuse being part of this equation is strong. And strong. it would have to be explored, yes. Right. Okay. It would have to be explored. Uh, okay, thanks for that, Peter. Um, now, I did send you some additional um, transcripts, but obviously this a vast amount of work to go through them all, and you've done a fantastic job in analysing this one. Um, but uh, clearly, if we were to go through the vast amount of testimony that they've given, you think the same things would rightly come up again and again? Just I do. I, I believe that even the things that I have looked at all confirm the analysis. What makes this so strong is that this includes an embedded confession. They actually confessed to what they did. Mm -hmm. And I think we should not discount the word fall, that no one asked them if she fell. It was no part of the interview. He introduced that word. It's very important. Okay. Um, all right. Is there anything you, else you want to add about the, about the McCann case before I just ask you a few closing uh, questions, Peter? Yeah, I think I probably... Okay. Well, thanks. Thanks very much for that. Um, so, yeah, I, in my email to you, um, I mentioned other subjects, uh, non-criminal subjects. Have you ever considered non-criminal subjects? Because there are a lot of purported conspiracies or cover-ups out there that might not necessarily be criminal, where people could leak out information um, about uh, through statement analysis. So, do, have you ever considered that? Is it... I mean, professionally or about this case? No. Uh, um, well, in particular, I mean, I mentioned here uh, NASA, which is obviously an organization in America which went to the moon allegedly and has done lots of alleged things, which a lot of people question. Mm -hmm. um, um, some, something like that, would you, would you consider? Sure. Or do you think it might damage, you know, your reputation in terms of a criminal investigation? No. As a matter of fact, I work for businesses in doing employment analysis. Mm -hmm. And so if someone applies for a job and the United States government limits the questions that you're allowed to ask. So what I do for companies is it's legally sound. I will say to a uh, potential hire, please tell me about yourself. And if someone is a thief, they're going to tell me through the lens of statement analysis. So in terms of any other topic out there, if there are statements, we can analyze them. If they are official government releases, we can analyze it because there's a writer or writers behind that. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes we have statements from defense attorneys. Defense attorneys will reveal what they believe about their client's guilt or innocence. Right. Um, I analyzed, for example, um, Franklin Delano Roosevelt's statement about the December 7th attack by, uh, at Pearl Harbor by the Japanese Navy. Mm -hmm. okay. 
and um, he is deceptive about it being a surprise. Right. He wasn't truthful. Really? Yeah. So it, it matters, the longer that someone's in analysis, it matters not what the narrative is. Mm -hmm. The truth is the truth. Mm -hmm. So um, if it sounds absurd, um, I can't change that. I am just a scientist of that sense of mm -hmm. words. Mm -hmm. So if I look at a claim, and if the person intends to deceive, I'll pick it up. Right. Now, if the person is wrong, but they believe it, there's no deception there. Yeah. It's only their intention to deceive that I can pick up. Right. Uh, I've mentioned it in, in the notes here. That there's, there, was a, there was a press conference in 1969 when Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin allegedly came back from the moon. And it, it's probably be about 70 minutes. And they're speaking freely. They're asked quite open questions about what they experienced and... Uh, my feeling is this deception going on in there and they're, 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 they're not being truthful about what they've done on that mission, which I know a lot of, especially, you know, in this country, a lot of Americans, well, there's a lot of Americans don't believe that they, they went to the moon. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know what your feelings are on it, but uh, that would be some, that would be high on my list of things for you to look at if I was going to ask you to look at other things. Yes. Okay. And uh, it's simply look at to see if they are intending to deceive. Mm -hmm. Because um, in 1969, we look at the context, the, there is a great deal of fear between um, the West and the Soviets. And so there was a desire on each part to inflate their, knowledge, their scientific knowledge to try to avoid nuclear exchange. Mm -hmm. um, pretty tense times. So if um, one of the astronauts is speaking freely, it's very likely I can tell you if he's intending to deceive or not. Okay. Okay, all right then. Um, and just if people watching this, Peter, want to um, get involved themselves and become statement analysts, what's your advice? They must have formal training. Um, as you've seen now through this, that the information on a blog is very short without much explanation. And without the discipline of formal training, um, even very intelligent people will go astray. And so maybe they will hit 70% accuracy, but the 30% misses are going to discredit not only themselves, but the science. Mm -hmm. So we have courses that they take at home, but each course comes with 12 months of support. So they never submit an errant report. You always have someone looking at your work, correcting your work. And if they're wrong, we can go right back and say, here's where it went off. Right. And so you can correct it and follow the principles. It isn't... Um, as it's made to seem through Hollywood or, or now through Facebook, um, there are no magic truth wizards. There are no people that are just um, born. And Dr. Paul Ekman had studied the micro expressions of people to show how they reveal their emotions by slowing down the video frame by frame. And what that led to was lots of people taking this training of trying to spot that it doesn't translate into any success in investigations. Um, if you ask me, as a matter of public record, Peter, your conclusion that the McCanns are showing guilty knowledge in the death of Madeline, how sure are you of that? Mm -hmm. um, I am able to answer that knowing that my career is looked at and say, I'm certain. Okay. All right, and Peter, well, uh, I'd just like to thank you very much indeed, and uh, it's been a, a pleasure to have met you. Thank you. Thank you.